Lake Turkana in modern day Kenya sits in a depression where the earth is pulling itself apart. Tectonic activity here perpetually warps the land, inviting in new rivers only to block them off thousands of years later. The result is a landscape which forever alternates between arid floodplain and desert lake. The movement of all of this earth and water means that sometimes things get buried and, protected from the elements, preserve a snapshot of another time in Earth's history. In 2012, researchers digging into the sediment uncovered such a snapshot, made up of ancient stones buried for 3.3 million years. To you or I, this would be nothing but rubble in the dirt, but these researchers noticed something peculiar about these rocks. They showed signs of being worked. Flakes of stone had been systematically chipped away from larger cores to preserve a sharp cutting edge. But who or what made these tools? The researchers who discovered them provide a fascinating answer. These were the tools of our ancestors. More ape-like than human, these were creatures with brains only slightly larger than chimpanzees. They could walk around on two legs like us, but may have still lived a large part of their lives in the trees. The stone hand axes they made were probably used to crack open the bones of ancient cattle in order to access the nutritious marrow inside. These humble beginnings stand in stark contrast to the modern world we now inhabit. The savannah has been replaced by concrete and copper. If we really do belong to the same evolutionary tree, how does one go from a ground-dwelling ape scavenging the carcass of dead buffalo to a globally ubiquitous creature with aspirations to colonize other planets? The first culprit is often some genetic mutation giving us high intelligence. And while our brain power is pretty impressive compared to other animals, it's not so special that it can explain this degree of dominance. After all, for over 200,000 years, our bodies and minds have been virtually unchanged. If brute brain power was responsible, then either we would have mastered electricity and bridge building long ago, or the modern brain would have exploded in size in only the last few thousand years. But if not intelligence, what's left? The answer comes from looking not at what exists inside our heads, but rather what exists between them. See, sometime in our evolutionary past, we picked up the habit of learning from our ancestors. An individual Homo sapien may be an impressive animal to behold, but as part of a network whose roots probe deep into space and time, he is almighty. We owe our breathtaking dominance of this planet not to the raw computing power of our brains, but to the greatest evolutionary vehicle in existence. Culture. We're not the only creatures who have culture. Humpback whales have musical calls which differ by region and show a tendency to go viral just like pop songs. Both birds and monkeys have been shown in an experimental setting to have cultural biases, preferring to copy the foraging techniques that are dominant in the group rather than using equally effective alternative strategies. These findings suggest that a kind of cultural psychology has been honed by natural selection for many different species and is not a uniquely human trait. Yet if that was the case, then why haven't we seen birds or whales taken over the world like we have? 
The difference is not simply that we have more culture, it's that for us, and seemingly us alone, culture took over the reins from genes as the prime driver of our evolution. Genetic evolution works because when organisms reproduce, their offspring obtain a unique blend of their parents' DNA, an instruction manual for how to build that particular organism. The manual though isn't perfect, and the typos it contain might code for some handicap, say a poor immune system, or some advantage, like sharper vision. Naturally, those individuals with the advantageous genes are more likely to survive and pass on those genes to their offspring. Generation after generation, as organisms shed harmful genes and gain beneficial ones, a species will gradually morph into an effective survival machine. The problem with this genes first approach to evolution is that it's slow. If a lucky individual evolved the fire making gene, it could take thousands of generations to spread throughout the population. Additionally, any helpful genetic mutations are created only when their host reproduces. Our ancestors, like us, would have had intervals of several years between births, limiting the rate at which new mutations can occur. Compare this to cultural evolution. Here, the only limit to how fast an ability or idea can spread and mutate is how well the individuals can communicate. You teach me how to haft flint to a spear, I figure out that bone flies better than flint, and then I teach bone hafted spear making to somebody else. It's this cumulative evolution of culture that explains how we can go from the combustion engine to space travel in only 100 years. Let's assume for a moment that our ancestors had some kind of primitive culture, perhaps not too dissimilar from these nutcracking chimps in the Ivory Coast. Once you have a mind able to process culture, then a beautiful dance starts to happen between culture and genes. Assuming that on the whole, having cultural knowledge, like which rocks are the best for cracking nuts, is better than not having that knowledge then those individuals who, by the good fortune of their genes, are better at picking up cultural information, are more likely to survive and pass on their superior cultural learning genes. Generation after generation, more and more individuals will be better learners and arbiters of cultural know-how. But the influence goes the other way too. As the number of individuals participating in cultural life grows, so does the richness of their cultural repertoire. Culture will increasingly become part of everyday life. This in turn will give rise to more cultural learners, and these learners will create even more culture. A positive feedback loop is created between the cultural software and the genetic hardware which runs it. But there's another feedback loop here too, equally if not more important. Since participating in the cultural life of the group is so important to your survival, you better make sure others like you. If they don't, aside from the difficulty of finding a mate, you're also not likely to get close enough to other apes to learn from them. So being able to anticipate the moods and intentions of others becomes important. Being capable of showing that you are an ally someone they can trust becomes important. In this way, selection for cultural learning abilities go hand in hand with selection for social skills. The evolutionary drive towards cultural learning endowed our ancestors with a pro-social psychology. This social nature in turn allows larger, more socially cohesive groups to exist and these are capable of generating ever larger cultural repertoires. And good thing too, the larger these groups get, the greater the chances that internal conflict will break them up. That is, if you don't have culture acting as the social glue. Shaking hands, saying grace, 
removing shoes, respecting elders, the list of cultural norms and traditions in our world is endless. They let us know where we stand in relation to others, whom we can trust, and how we should behave. Human life without culture is no more possible than fish without water. Stepping back, a broad trend emerges. The ubiquitous of crude culture amongst our primate family suggests that some form of cultural ability has been present in our lineage for millions of years. Our ancestors would have inherited this ability, and evolution discovered that it was a powerful lever to work with. Culture became the central axis of the human evolutionary machine, and any genetic adaptations that fueled the engine were locked in, whether they helped with cultural learning or making friends. The overall effect of the machine was to shape the individual human form and to transform his group into a society, ripe with an ever-evolving cultural identity. But how did the engine get going in the first place? What was it about the starting conditions of our ancestors that meant that their culture could stack while whale culture could not? According to evolutionary biologist Joseph Henrik, for cumulative cultural evolution to get going, a species needs to circumvent the startup problem. It's a chicken and egg scenario. Big brains are needed to handle complex culture, but complex culture requires big brains. In the early days of a lineage, where cumulative cultural evolution hasn't taken off yet, there might not be enough cultural knowledge around to justify an increase in brain power. With no fancy tools or food gathering strategies to learn, any individual who found themselves with a bigger brain would be no better off than their slightly dumber siblings and perhaps worse off due to the high energy demands of big brains. As such, getting the cultural engine going is a matter of crossing a crucial threshold, where enough cultural know-how is present that successive generations who evolve bigger brains will be reliably rewarded with reproductive success. So how did our ancestors jumpstart the engine? For a start, they had their hands free from walking. Researchers still debate what exactly it was that led to our ancestors being able to walk upright, but what we do know is that once they could, they had a powerful natural endowment at their disposal. Our ancestors could pinch, pick, cup, dig, pull, squeeze, all while striding around the landscape. In terms of energy expenditure, Walking upright is far more efficient than moving around on all fours, and so our ancestors could exploit a larger territory than their competitors. What we've also observed in our ape cousins is that they tend to use tools more often when they're on the ground than they do in the trees, and for a simple reason, tools always fall to the ground. Any curious mind can wander over for a play, and with their view unobstructed, can imitate how other apes are using their implements. This is exactly the environment our ancestors would have lived in, with populations that would have bunched together for safety. The Africa of 3 million years ago was home to twice as many predators as today, which included packs of wild dogs and saber-toothed cats with a specialty for ambushing their prey from the bush. Ground-dwelling mammals faced with these kind of threats typically seek safety in numbers, and for our ancestors, that meant more individuals around to learn from. So, what do we have? Creatures with a dexterous hand, freed from holding their weight while moving, living in condensed, highly social groups, smart enough to innovate on their own, but also eager to learn from others. What's likely is that for a period of hundreds of thousands of years or more, cultural innovation would appear in fits and starts. A group would learn some new food extraction technique, then famine would strike, the group would split, and the knowledge lost. One step forward, 
two steps back. At some point, however, our species crossed the crucial threshold. Enough cultural know-how existed over a long enough period to give cultural evolution a foothold. The engine had kicked into gear, and cumulative cultural evolution set off like a runaway train. It can be hard to appreciate just how transformative this engine was. Every aspect of our physiology, not only our brains, was affected. Our stomach shrunk, and shrunk further still when its work was outsourced to a marvellous cultural invention we call cooking. The increasing use of our hands favoured the evolution of the opposable thumb, and opened up an even larger armoury of possible tools. The evolution of running as a genetic innovation and clothing as a cultural one were likely both linked to the loss of our body hair, whose heat trapping effects became a detriment to long distance travel. This after all could be compensated for when needed by the furs of the animals we were learning to hunt. And that hunting itself would have favoured the evolution of a shoulder joint fit for hurling spears at antelope. With bigger, culturally complex communities came innovations in communication too. Our faces became more expressive, able to communicate non-verbally through expressions like smiling or rolling the eyes. <laughs> Laughter evolved from the hooting of playing apes to a ubiquitous trigger for bonding several individuals in a wide variety of social situations. Our vocal tracks became flexible enough to handle a variety of different sounds, sounds that we would use to manage our social status with gossip. Some of the most dramatic changes affected adolescence. Natural selection actually pushed the evolution of the human form down a dangerous cul-de-sac, caught between larger brains and heads on one side and narrower hips and birth canals on the other. As a consequence, modern human babies pop out right before their heads get too big for the birth canal. But this means that they're also massively underdeveloped, at least when compared to chimp brains at birth. Human newborns are helpless and completely dependent on care for the first few years of their life, which for any other creature could herald extinction. Because the mother is tied up providing childcare, it may be several years before she can have another child. Such a slow rate of reproduction leaves a species vulnerable to environmental shocks. Our ancestors' solution to this problem can be summed up by the adage, it takes a village to raise a child. Put simply, other individuals helped mum with childcare. This phenomena, called alloparenting, is the norm in contemporary hunter-gatherer societies where up to 50% of the childcare is frequently shared amongst the mother's sisters, mother, close friends, and other children. By offloading some of the child rearing to close family and friends, mum is able to give birth more frequently, and the population better able to weather food shortages or other crises. But there's another benefit here too. Most of a human's brain development happens outside of the womb, amongst the community, the social womb. It's during this adolescence period, which is extremely long compared to other mammals, that a human brain is engendered with all the norms and values of its society. While growing, the brain is attuned to such knowledge. Infants as young as two have been shown to intuit social norms and enforce them on others without any direct instruction. Our brains are hardwired for the conduction of culture. The broad stroke narrative here is one of self-domestication. Every adaptation, behavioural, cultural, genetic, served to broaden and deepen our social lives. Eventually, starting around 2 million years ago, some of our ancestral cousins, by now living in groups of about 100, ejected themselves from Africa and populated a wide territory through the Middle East to China. 
A bipedal, culturally complex ape was a novel, highly successful species. And as so often happens when nature discovers a successful form, it disperses into various ecological nooks. Each disbursement takes on its own special flavour of the original branch, much like the ancestral bear has become the panda in Asia, polar bear in the Arctic, and black bear in America. For us, this means names like Homo habilis, Homo erectus, and Homo floresiensis, our ancient cousins. But one twig in the Homo family bush did not venture out of Africa, but in fact stayed there until sometime after 200,000 years ago. These were our direct ancestors. They lived across the African continent in small bands of hunter-gatherers who were probably intertwined in larger regional constellations linked by shared cultural and linguistic traits. When some of these bands began to leave Africa, they probably did so for similar reasons as us. The excitement of new lands, the impoverishment of the old ones, or the chance to escape one's social baggage and start anew. Their expansion began in Saudi Arabia and the Eastern Mediterranean, a lush region at this time through which herds of large herbivores travelled. They would have settled across a wide expanse, meeting and interbreeding with their ancestral cousins who had arrived hundreds of thousands of years earlier. By 65,000 years ago, sapiens had sailed from Indonesia's islands to Australia, and by 18,000 years, were in the Americas via the land bridge that then connected Russia and North America. A particularly fascinating episode occurred in Europe when Sapiens started settling down in areas their Neanderthal cousins had occupied for over 300,000 years. Probably following in the wake of retreating ice sheets, Sapiens arrived about 43,000 years ago, and within a meagre 15,000 years, were the only human species remaining there. This episode has been often used as a lens onto what made Homo sapiens so special. After all, if we outcompeted the Neanderthals, we were clearly the superior species. But Neanderthals, it seems, were just as remarkable. They made music, crafted complex weapons and tools, and hunted formidable prey like woolly mammoths and rhino. In short, they seem to display all the same complex cultural behavior as sapiens. So what caused them to disappear? Some researchers have speculated that the social brain of sapiens, which had evolved in the warm abundance of the tropics, may have been better attuned to living in larger numbers. In contrast, Neanderthals had adapted to the deep cold of Ice Age Europe by living in small bands of hunter-gatherers where social organization may have become more rigid. Others have suggested that sapiens may have built up a tolerance to disease at lower latitudes that Neanderthals did not have. Once we arrived and began interbreeding, Neanderthals would have contracted disease from us at a higher rate than we did from them. Even if these theories were true, one group of researchers concluded that there needn't be anything special about the sapien species to explain our victory. All it would take is the constant arrival of new sapien bands from the population-dense south into the demographically stale north. Since sapiens and Neanderthals operated in the same ecological niche, this constant bubbling over of sapien populations would only need to outweigh the Neanderthals' rate of reproduction, and in about 10,000 years, our Neanderthal cousins would be gone. Whatever the precise cause, the disappearance of the Neanderthals fits into a larger narrative which played out everywhere sapiens migrated.
giant sloths. Cave lions. European hippos. The world of our ancestors was full of utterly gigantic animals that had been evolving for millions of years. Yet in a matter of thousands, they all went extinct. We hunted these animals directly and hunted the animals they depended on. Ultimately, this pressure caused the incumbent food chains to buckle as they re-equilibrated to a new invasive species. By 40,000 years ago, we know that some populations of sapiens had started to live in larger, denser, and more sedentary groups. They lived in interconnected networks of tribes, trading in resources, and periodically coming together for ritual ceremonies. Rather than living hand to mouth, they were planning around the seasons, hoarding food in the plentiful months and distributing it in the scarce ones. They were also habitually tending and harvesting from particular plants. These were the seeds of what would later blossom in the widespread adoption of agriculture. Such a settled society, organized around a greater stability in resources, could afford to train specialists in areas like weapons, art, clothing, and medicine. The strength provided by this diversity of talents integrated within a cultural or regional identity, allowed ever larger groups to exist without falling into disharmony. This same pattern would, over thousands of years, find expression in the evolution of the state, the military, and finance. These cultural technologies were simply amplifications of an ancient trend, bonding groups of individuals through cultural products and traditions. Underpinning all of this is the same evolutionary engine ticking away at Lake Turkana 3.3 million years ago. Each gear in the engine turns at its own pace, but the overall effect, the cumulative effect, is that of phenomena ever increasing in scale. What we're left with today is a sense of accelerating change. The machine isn't just getting bigger, it's getting bigger faster. This begs an obvious question. Can we keep expanding forever? The environmental stance is unequivocally no. But that still leaves the philosophical consideration. As a species, we have always invaded new territories. The model of cumulative cultural evolution runs on growth. Those increasingly rare hunter-gatherer societies who had seemed to have found some kind of equilibrium with nature are virtually all now subsumed within a global, financially mediated culture. Despite all the calls to the contrary, our hunger for more seems as insatiable as ever. But if expansion is all we've ever known, can we know ourselves beyond expansion? <laughs>